uh, semi-official start time, so maybe we should begin. Let me remind you that we're going to have uh, one more session next week on Friday. You should all have received an email about this, um, which uh, is an opportunity to have a more general discussion about life in science, uh, choices of career trajectories, and so on. Um, there'll be a panel, and, and uh, you're welcome to um, ask questions in a very free-ranging way. Um, if you would like, you can also email questions in advance. I will put a note in the chat in just a moment with the, as a, with a reminder of the email address. Um, and um, that way we can at least uh, organize the discussion around, around some questions that, that, that are prepared in advance, but we hope that it'll be also a little more interactive. Um, so without further ado, um, let me welcome Vadim back for the, for the second of his two lectures about driven many body systems. Um, Vadim, thank you. All right, um, so just a quick reminder. Um, I, um, I think I ended, I'm pretty sure I ended somewhere halfway through the you know, introduction of Floquet formalism and the physics that it brings. So I'm going to try and um, step back um, a couple of slides and just remind where we ended. Um, the most salient points about the first part, which was how we break equilibrium statistical mechanics uh, in many body systems, you know, which is a code word for many body localization. That this is the only thing that I covered really. Um, it will be restated later in this lecture, so I'm not going to re, uh, uh, rehash that. And as, as always, people can stop and ask questions. Uh, I'm guessing that's not a chat message that I need to see. Yeah, okay, good. Um, all right, so, um, so I started introducing driven systems by going back probably 100 years, if not more, by now, which is um, something that I uh, think of generally referred to as the Robbie problem where one takes a, uh, a, a nice two-level system and uh, exposes it to a drive. And there are different kinds of Robby problems. Uh, one of them is where you uh, uh, drive it monochromatically, this cosine. Um, there is the Landa, famous landau zener problem where you sweep one of the uh, parameters, one of the terms in the Hamiltonian. And there are many more. Right. We'll only be interested in the, these first two. Um, so there is a, a straightforward tool to do this, um, which is uh, a vastly, which is very popular, and it's called the uh, um, uh, rotating wave approximation. I'm partly going through this because I realized that there were a couple of mistakes or typos on my slides yesterday. The idea is uh, so right. So the rotating wave uh, approximation is not an approximation in the sense that what one does is that one changes the simple cosine drive into uh, a, a drive by which the transverse component of the field uh, rotates rather than oscillates in magnitude. And then uh, these familiar sequence of steps apply. And um, here what we see is that the unitary, and again, I'm missing psi here. I, oops, I assume you can see my cursor. The, the, uh, the evolution here is unitary because it's just the time span Hamiltonian, but it's nicely factorized into two unitaries. Um, and um, what one sees here is um, that it's, it, well, these being a poly matrix, it's nothing but precessions. Uh, the important thing is that there is a resonance when uh, the driving frequency omega is uh, close to the um, um, static term in the Hamiltonian, so-called Larmor, Larmor frequency, um, the frequency of Larmor precession. And so what one sees here is that in the simple sort of a two-level problem, the resonance is never sharp because the drive magnitude is finite. So the resonance is broadened by the fact that you're driving it with a finite amplitude perturbation. It's called power broadening in experimental literature. Okay. And um, so one of the um, applications that I would like you to keep in mind for later is the so-called application to hole burning, where you imagine driving the system and then probing it later. And as long as the, you know, 
the approximation of loosely non-interacting two-level systems applies, the application of this drive, the pump, what I call the pump at the frequency capital omega, uh, changes the distribution of two-level systems. So here I'm imagining there's an ensemble of two-level systems with fields that are broadly distributed. And so here the idea is that the two-level systems that are on resonance, they're, they're disturbed the most. And even though the system doesn't have the notion of temperature, on average, we find half-half occupation for up and down, which is observable. And here in this cartoon, I sketched out what the absorption spectrum of this problem is in equilibrium. And after the pump, you observe that some of the uh, uh, two-level systems, the ones that are close to the resonance, have been effectively bleached. They, their probabilities are half-half. They're unable to uh, uh, absorb any more energy. All right, so keep this in mind. Uh, the other thing that, uh, you know, that I wanted to restate um, uh, cleanly is this sort of diabetic transition. So usually if you now consider the landau zener type setup where you sweep the field from negative to positive, from zero to TF, um, there is a transition uh, from up to down and depending on how fast you sweep, uh, when you sweep slowly, you get the uh, adi you know, you get adiabatic transition where you go from ground state to ground state. But when you sweep fast, you go from ground state to the first excited state. But a little bit of the state um, leaks into the ground state. Right? So you make a transition. And this may be evaluated uh, uh, by lots of different calculations. Here, this is computed by a firm golden rule. And so here's the result that I'd like to remember. And as I said that, you know, there's some typos or mistakes on the slide last time, so I fixed it. All right. Uh, I assume there, there are no questions, so I'm just going to keep going. Okay. Um, so this is to recap locate dynamics. Um, we consider um, Hamiltonians, which are time periodic with period capital T. Um, and so, in, um, so formally, one can define a unitary operator, which takes you from time little t to time t plus capital T. And uh, formally, this is a time order exponential that one has to compute somehow. Um, sometimes it's useful to talk about the Floquet Hamiltonian, which is a logarithm of the uh, unitary. That's not well defined because of multi-valuedness of the logarithm. But in some cases, this is sort of convenient because one can just talk about the average Hamiltonian, as you'll see on the next couple of slides. Um, so the useful thing about having a unitary is that your evolution stroboscopically looks very simple. It's a matrix evolution. And so you can, uh, so it's linear, would be an old quantum mechanics problems. And so what one can study uh, spectral properties of the unitary and learn from that what what's going, you know, try to characterize problems that way. H having um, eigenstates is very useful because one can expand, uh, one can look at time evolution of operators and there are diagonal matrix elements and off diagonal matrix elements. And what one can see is rather clearly is that if, whoops, if the, um, <clears throat> if the system is sufficiently large and infinite, the uh, existence of these oscillatory terms here is unimportant because they all deface. And so the point is that in a finite system, this whole sum has to be evaluated and you will see that operators have all kinds of harmonics attached to them. Whereas um, in, uh, um, or subharmonics I should say, Whereas uh, in um, uh, um, infinite systems, in some infinite systems, I should say, the uh, operators become time, become stationary. In other words, they synchronize with the drive. Okay. <clears throat> um, as I already said, you know, existence of eigenstates and uh, uh, eigen uh, quasi-energies, as they're called, because they're constrained to zero to two pi, 
is very useful because you can basically lift whatever intuition or technology, you know, data analysis technology you have for Hamiltonian problems and just apply them here without thinking too much, at least at first. Okay. Um, so at the level of doing calculations, um, there are different ways of implementing these Floquet problems. And, you know, to my mind, this one, even though it's practically applicable, is you know, br driven by the general dislike of time ordered exponentials. Um, and so instead of, and we've already seen a version of this in the rotating wave solution, instead of thinking of a unitary uh, uh, evolution as some time ordered exponential, you can basically say that, no, 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 let, let's just think of it as a stroboscopic switch in the uh, uh, Hamiltonian from eight, well, in this case, HX to HZ. Um, and, you know, the reason I'm uh, the reason for this choice is because you'll see it in a few slides when we discuss time crystals. So the idea here is that um, HX and HZ individually are trivial, or tri trivial in the sense that one can uh, manually write down their solution. Here it's diagonal in the X basis, here it's diagonal in the Z basis. These are basically pieces of the Ising model, or Ising chain. And, but the point is that because these two terms don't commute, the uh, unitary that you obtain by taking a product is non trivial. Um, the disadvantage of this bang bang protocol is that uh, there is no, um, uh, at, at least I should say, the, the perturbation theory for the, in, directly in this floquet, for, uh, in this unitary formalism, is uh, in this unitary representation, is not as straightforward as the perturbation theory for. Uh, Hamiltonians, at least I, uh, I tend to have to think every time I have to do it myself. Um, whereas for the Hamiltonians, this is a very well trodden path. And, and partly because of this, whoops, partly, just do, partly because of this, um, it's, uh, uh, there's an alternate way of realizing uh, a time periodic perturbations, which is just having monochromatic perturbations or perturbations with a few cosines rather than stroboscopic, which makes us lots of cosines. And um, this is quite ancient. It's probably also 100 years old or more. This sort of uh, um, uh, goes, I think, the terminology in classical uh, mechanics is secular perturbation theory. Um, in uh, NMR, this is known as the average Hamiltonian formalism. And one basically goes and I would say effectively using the short time expansion for the unitary computes order by order uh, um, uh, corrections to the whatever the, the, uh, the reference Hamiltonian, which is time independent. And the structure that emerges here is that the, uh, 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 you know, if the perturbation is a high frequency perturbation, you get natural powers of one over omega that naturally uh, um, uh, give you a perturbative structure. Okay, so that's as far as gen general formalism. Now, what physics do we generally expect? And um, I think the, the most immediate thing that comes to mind is, well, I should ask if there are any questions. No, I don't really see, I should see if anybody's uh, using a video, but maybe not. Right, okay, so there's nothing to see. Um, good. Um, so the thing that we generally expect when, when we expose a problem, so if the problem has a reference ha Hamiltonian, which is time independent, i.e. it has a spectrum, it has certain intrinsic properties. This goes back to the discussion in the first couple of slides that, you know, we can think of, we usually think of driven problems as problems being, that have intrinsic uh, characteristics, for example, the conductivity. So if we're allowed to think of our driven problem that way, and you know, going back to two slides, you realize that you know, for the this bang bang formulation, that's problematic because individually these two problems are rather uh, inert, and boring, and so uh, doing perturbate, you know, applying intuition to in this formalism becomes problematic. Uh, but however, let's think more generally. Let's think that we're going to introduce drive as a weak perturbation. And so we can lift 
you know, linear response intuition from uh, the Hamiltonian problems, then we know that there's a conductivity in most problems, or there's some kind of a dissipative coefficient that couples to the drive, or the drive couples to, rather. And so what we expect is that there's a finite heating rate. And we can estimate that heating rate by just estimating the conductivity or measuring it. Um, now, the interesting thing is that um, since we already uh, uh, talked about high frequency as a good ordering uh, 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 or good perturbative uh, uh, knob, we know that um, in non interacting problems, the bandwidth is finite, you know, these typical non interacting problems, the bandwidth is finite, and that means the conductivity vanishes at high frequencies. The consequence of that is that this uh, uh, Magnus expansion, as it's called, is uh, convergent in those problems. And so order by order, you, one can compute uh, to, increase, to increasing accuracy the uh, uh, evolution of the problem. Um, and, and that has certain benefits, but it's also from the physics point of view, that's, that's a short story. Right? There's an effective uh, average Hamiltonian and one just has to work hard to compute it. Um, the generic many body problem has no bandwidth because you know the spectrum is extensive and uh, matrix elements of current can couple states that are far away in energy. In fact, generically, um, I think it's true, although there's no um, textbook um, explanation for this. Um, the conductivity of a generic many body problem, and by generic, I mean something on the lattice, something that doesn't have uh, you know black holes and stuff like that. Um, um, is exponential at high frequencies. Okay. So the heating rate that you would get is very slow, but finite. Um, so th th then, uh, so we run into one of these questions is that, well, is it a, a matter of principle or practice? You know, do we care if the heating rate is finite when it's so small? Um, I think that depends on who you ask. Um, but, you know, if you ask me, I think it's interesting if there are situations, if there's physics that would turn that, you know, turn this heating question around and say, no, no, in some problems, there should be no heating. And I think one candidate for um, such a situation was the many body localized system. And by now we have, um, you know, at least uh, a picture for how this works out. And so I will uh, have a couple of slides on that um, shortly. But basically the issue the challenge there is that at, le at the level of linear response, many body localized systems also have a finite conductivity. So they start heating initially. Okay, and just to give you a spoiler, going beyond linear response is how you see that they uh, stop heating at some point. So as I already said, that the, the uh, 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 you know few body problems or, or non attracting problems tend to have. Uh, uh, no heating, or they can have no heating, and that opens up uh, a vast field of possibilities that goes by the name of Floquet engineering. Um, and uh, I meant to have pretty pictures of what can what one can engineer with, uh, uh, you know. Uh, and there are very nice reviews, and as I promised, I will um, uh, populate these slides with reviews uh, when I po when we post them online. Um, but that's not physics. Well, physicists, when physicists write review articles called, called Floquet Engineering, uh, you know, this is something one looks up as a, as a, um, whenever one needs to get things done, not to really understand things. Um, so, um, so here's one or one of two slides on how thermalization is detected, right? So I said that as a general principle, at short time, these things, you know, these problems have to heat up when driven, but it was actually not a foregone conclusion in the sense that, uh, you know, I was a referee on this paper <laughs> and it was having a hard time. This was one of the first papers to try to flesh this out. And the paper was having a hard time in part because, um, in large part, because there was no clear distinction in in the community about what uh, uh, many body really meant. As, you know, at least as far as I could see, some of the resistance had to do with 
Well, we know lots of examples where things don't heat up. Yeah, so somebody pointed out uh, 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 that there are nice videos of Kapitza Pendula. Um, yeah, no, I, I think this is just such a vast and pretty uh, uh, um, set of possibilities. Um, I think, so in this review, okay, since, since there's interest, let me just comment. Um, I rec recommend this review um, in part because it attempts to classify types of um, problems that you can um, play with, you know, you know, with this flow K engineering, because, you know, the reviews that are mostly focused on band structures and material science kind of um, problems that are also useful in their own right. But this review tends to sort of step back and look at all of these um, older problems and ask, well, this problem is different from that problem. And this is, this is the reason. Anyhow, uh, I, I tend to enjoy reading about these things, but you know, I, I think these problems are just uh, very detail driven and <laughs> a little bit um, too complicated. But this is a generic, what I'm showing now is a generic situation, right? You take a, a, a generic um, interacting lattice Hamiltonian and you uh, make it flow K. And you ask yourself, how would you know um, that it's heating up? And um, it's actually difficult to find very clean numerical studies of, you know, temporal heating, because these are small problems. There's a lot of details and fluctuations and what, what have you. And I think the nice thing about this uh, line of work, which, you know, as I said, this is one of the earlier papers, but there are many others, is to say, you know, forget about time. Let's just look at the spectrum, right? As I emphasized that the, the Floquet problem is a spectral problem. So one can essentially lift everything that we know from studies of, by, by now we know from studies of thermalization, um, which, you know, essentially became mature in the late 2010s. Oh, I should say, in the, you know, in the late aughts. <laughs> by 2010, we sort of had a, a, a cookbook for how to think about thermalization, which was, you know, developed over a period of five years or so. <clears throat> and uh, um, now let's just apply it to Floquet problems. And, um, you know, and it looks pretty good, right? So they, one, of, one of the ideas that uh, I discussed before is that um, eigenstates, um, eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian um, should follow random matrix statistics. And so there's a characteristic here, which is comprised of little gaps in the spectrum. Um, and, you know, as a word of warning, Floquet problems tend to be more difficult for numerics for, for reasons we don't fully understand. And maybe it, they're, they're not as bad now because people have learned how to make them more generic. But for example, here, what one sees is that the distribution is very noisy. Uh, the green dashed curve is the prejudice. That's what the random matrix theory predicts. And what one sees is that the deviation from random matrix theory is decaying as a function. This is the inset that I'm tracing over right now. The deviation, the, the norm between these two distributions evaluated numerically decays as L goes to infinity. And by infinity, we, we're at 24. Right? But you might say that it's 1 over L. So 1 over 24 is not that bad. Um, I don't really know how to. Yes, L is the length of the lattice. That's correct. Um, you know, for comparison, the, 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 uh, the best Hamiltonian problems at that point already by 18 would be much closer to the random matrix prediction. Um, now, the other thing that these people have done, and this is sort of to uh, connect to the previous uh, um, point about uh, uh, rate of absorption, um, you, if you look in steady states and you ask how much heat have they absorbed, um, and so there's this measure that was constructed to look at averages and compare it to the initial. So there was a reference Hamiltonian, there was a driver, so you could ask, compared to the eigenstates of the reference Hamiltonian, how, how do Floquet eigenstates differ? Um, this thing is normalized so that minus one means no absorption and zero means infinite temperature. In other words, they're just fully randomized. And what you see is that for sufficiently rapid drives here, when t, t is the period, so for sufficiently rapid drives, 
the rate of absorption is so small that these small systems don't even see it, right? This is very close to zero. And, I, you know, I think natural interpretation, I don't know if the authors of this, I don't remember if the authors, authors of this paper pursued that, you know, taking logarithms or not, is that you're heating, but you're just heating so weakly that finite size systems somehow don't, uh, that, that's negligible. And what, what you see is that even uh, for long periods, when you actually start, or low frequencies, when you start heating appreciably, um, you know, it takes, you know, keep in mind that uh, at, uh, the system size here is 24, but the Hilbert space size is two to the, two, two to the 24. So these are enormous spectra, right? And so there's no quantization of, there's no discreteness of spectra to be worried about, yet these problems don't really heat uh, that, that well. All right, sorry, I think there was a question. Let me just quickly have a look see. Yeah, what's the dimension of the, uh, sorry, um, these are chains. All of the numerics uh, 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 in this kind of line of work are done, usually done on, on uh, one dimensional chains. And uh, dimensionality might play a role, but not, uh, uh, not, not for this. We believe that uh, uh, one dimensional lattices can thermalize. There may be some anomalies elsewhere, but you know, not for thermalization. Anyway, let me try to speed up. Um, so one, one, one thing to do, so here, for example, the observable that one looked was just the average amount of energy absorbed. Um, but one can look at a typical observable and one can look at how different eigenstates differ. In particular, what we expect from eigenstate thermalization, which is something I discussed, is that um, the equilibrium thermodynamics is encoded in eigenstates in the sense that uh, eigenstates at the same energy on average will have the same expectation value. That means that of, of whatever local observable you're interested in, that means that, so the horizontal axis here is, uh, in each of these panels, is the uh, uh, eigenstate index. And for uh, uh, static problems, that's just the energy. And so what you see is that as function of energy, the mean of the observable evolves, the fluctuations are there, but they're relatively benign. The only thing that changes when you go to flow K is that energy is not a good quantum number. So this phase, this uh, I, uh, quasi energy um, should not affect what the average is. And so this thing doesn't disperse. But once you break thermalization, um, um, you, you find that uh, the, um, the averages are all over the map. Okay, the large fluctuations. So um, let me uh, try to wrap up this preliminary portion. Um, so the uh, uh, breaking of thermalization is as far, I mean, the, the most generic thing that people do when they want to, you know, study the, the, the behavior in the absence of thermalization is just to uh, go to one of their favorite MBL Hamiltonians. And so what you expect is, so the intuition again is that, whoops, the intuition again is that all of these systems will heat initially, they will absorb a little bit of energy or some energy um, and then at uh, um, long enough times, if the degrees of freedom that absorb the energy are local, and so because of these emergence of localized charges, you have some hope that these degrees of freedom are, are relatively local, then um, you, you will be able to just saturate those degrees of freedom and uh, absorption will stop. However, there's a length scale associated with these degrees of freedom and there's a length scale associated with uh, uh, which, you know, essentially when you absorb some energy, uh, over what scales do you make excitations? And so the, the length scale on, on which you find resonant pairs to make excitations is typically frequency dependent. And what one expects is that at high frequencies, you should get, you know, so, so if, okay, the axis here are disorder on the horizontal axis and driving frequency. So let's pick a system that's localized, um, which is to say that you know, disorder is large enough. And so the idea is that if we started high frequencies for the same reasons why single particle absorption uh, um, was bounded, um, completely bound, zero, for the same reason, here one can have a convergent, if you like, high frequency sort of regime where you know, maybe you'll find a few 
places to get absorbed initially, but then you saturate them and all the rest of them do not absorb. But as you reduce the frequency, the, uh, uh, the, the, the nature of the process becomes less and less local, and so you, that breaks down. So, that, so this kind of a phase diagram now in the Floquet and BL problem is um, pretty standard now, um, although you can see that the dots, you know, there are certain parts of it that are not fully fleshed out, and especially the, how this goes in the zero frequency limit is pretty unclear, um, or somewhat unclear, I should say. Um, and now, so this is sort of another uh, way to discuss this, which I find particularly uh, clear, um, because, you know, w one of the things that, that becomes frustrating is because real-time dynamics is generally difficult to interpret, because there's a lot of things going on, um, most, vast majority of studies look like this. They, people look at the uh, infinite time averages, i.e. eigenstate properties of the system. Okay, whereas this intuition of how you cross over from absorption to non-absorption in the time domain, as natural as it is, it requires one to study things in the time domain. And so I, you know, I, I don't know of many studies that actually carefully looked at this. This is by uh, Michael Knopp and I, I'll put in the reference, Michael Knopp and collaborators. And so what you see here is that, um, so let, let's just uh, go, go through the left panel here. What you see here is that as a function of frequency at very high frequencies, there is stuff that's going on at short times that you know, is very non-universal. Um, then as a function of time, at some point you hit the linear response regime, but its extent is limited. And eventually you find a nonlinear response regime where the response is saturated. Um, and the kind of plots that they showed, which are, you know, um, confirming the intuition, they look like this. But it's very difficult to be <laughs> convinced, right? So there is this turnover. But you know, remember these systems are finite, so one doesn't know where the crossover to uh, 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 saturated behavior is system size dependent, and in fact, it usually is. Um, so that I, I would say that you know, complete resolution of this is um, difficult. You know, certainly, brute force numerical methods are not sufficient, but we believe in it because it makes sense from the physics point of view. All right. All right, so um, let's switch gears now. So um, there were a couple of questions. I'm happy to see if there are any more questions. Um, but the salient points here is that Floquet evolution is a matrix problem and one can study it by matrix means. And you know, by now there are theorems about Floquet. I mean, not by now, there have been steady dribble of theorems about these things from other communities. Uh, I think the physics of energy absorption is very generic, it's very complex. There are transients. Also the nature of the drive is important. You can drive it globally or locally and this will just show up. So I have not considered local drives. Uh, and finally, hole burning is the key thing that uh, 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 makes this interesting when, you're, when you have very loosely coupled subsystems. Okay. Um, Computational bottleneck, and uh, Yanis is asking, what is the computational bottleneck? Uh, I mean, the only way I know how to study these problems is to put them on the computer. So um, there is a, uh, if you put it on the computer, there is an initial state that you might drive or a density matrix. So that immediately gives you a big object. Um, and there is the matrix vector multiplication or uh, ODE solver. So all of these problems are exponentially big in system size. Uh, depending on how clever you are, you can play with exponents. Um, there are matrix, so, so, you know, if, if you think of just the size of the system, uh, there's already a challenge. Um, but then there's, you know, the thing that shows up in all these this slow problems is the time of integration and how do you make sure that the errors that you accumulate uh, in, during the integration um, do not swamp the delicate, sometimes delicate physics. Okay. So I, I don't know about complexity. I mean, one can 
one can just look up complexities of typical ODE solvers and uh, and multiple, you know, basically consider that you're having a, a, a problem that's exponentially two to the L size. Um, uh, but but that tends to be sort of too loose of an estimate, I think, in my experience. Anyway, so let's continue. What's next? Uh, so as promised, we're going to switch to time crystals now, and this is actually very. Um, easy by comparison and uh you know i would say it's it, you know too easy <laughs> um so let me re remind you how eigenstate uh spin glass order was uh um, set up in the ising chain so let's consider the hamiltonian above um let's take the delta goes to zero limit um, then this is just a classical ising model it has no dynamics so every configuration is an eigenstate Reality. Um, and now what you observe is that uh, if one tries to do perturbation theory in delta, one find, and now we're going to do perturbation theory for the entire spectrum. That's usually not how we think of many body problems. We don't usually try to do perturbation theory for the entire spectrum because there are lots of degeneracies and perturbation theory should not be convergent. That's the case for the Ising model with no disorder. Right? There are many ways. There are many states where basically if you count the number of flips, you know what the energy is and there's an extensive degeneracy there. Now in the presence of disorder, that's no longer true. And so because th that opens uh, a window to do perturbation theory and what one finds is that um, um, the, 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 the intuitive structure of these states is actually robust, the, the, sorry, the classical structure of these states is actually robust order by order in perturbation theory in the transverse field. Um, and what one finds is that they, you know, they're in, in the same way that one has ground state uh, eigenstates of the parity in the finite systems, uh, in the finite system, the, the, the two eigenstates are not up and down because they don't, they break the symmetry. So the, the parity, which is flipping everybody up to down has to be a, 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 a the eigenstates have to be eigenstates of parity. And so these are just cat states, Schrodinger cat states between up and down, which are even and odd and parity. Um, now, the interesting thing is that because these are the eigenstates, um, they are, first of all, they're exponentially degenerate and the exponent has nothing to do with the density of, naive density of states. It has to do with the dynamical sort of tunneling between up to down. Um, so once you have the structure, you can basically lift what you know from studies of spin glasses, for example, going back to the original time persistence order parameter of Edwards and Anderson, it's finite if you compute it as a dynamical observable, which is how Edwards and Anderson defined it. Um, and, and, you know, the phenomenology basically follows. So now we um, would like to ask what happens if we um, consider the flow K generalization of this model. And, you know, for simplicity, we're going to keep it nearest neighbor and we're going to keep it uh, um, non -intra right. So the, 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 the thing that helps avoid any discussion or, or controversy in this problem is that, you know, there's a free fermion representation of this model and free fermions show this these phenomena, albeit, uh, albeit in a slightly, uh, 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 you know, obscured way. Um, but, but still, one can just do it with fermions. So similarly, if we turn off these terms, J int, in this description, we have essentially uh, uh, the uh, nearest neighbor rising model, except it's a Floquet problem. We have these two. And so um, here's the phase diagram. So you can see that there are, instead of two phases, so previously we had two phases. One phase was with a ground state paramagnet to a ground state ferromagnet, right? So when delta was, when delta is large, we have a paramagnetic state where everybody points along X. When delta is small, we have a ferromagnetic ground state. Sorry, there should be a minus sign. Um, and what these spin glass states were essentially excited states of the ferromagnet. You excite them, and because they're localized, they don't um, melt. So the interesting thing about the Floquet problem, you realize that uh, uh, the, the, the answer is that the phase diagram now has four states instead of two states. 
And so let's now try and understand these states. There are two states which are connected to, uh, um, to the uh, time independent, uh, uh, what do you want? And the Hamiltonian version of this, which are the states uh, that are attached to the uh, uh, left and the bottom phase boundaries. Because here, when we turn off JZ down here, we only have HX, and that's uh, just paramagnum. When we turn off uh, HX, we only have um, um, uh, JZ, and that's a ferromagnet. And so, so we're interested in this red phase. So I'm going to consider going across this phase diagram from the spin, conventional spin, spin glass into what these authors call pi spin glass, which is more now uh, more commonly known as a time crystal or discrete time crystal. But let's start with a spin glass, because if we understand the spin glass in the presence of the drive, then the other phase is uh, as a freebie almost. So the way to understand the spin glass in the presence of the drive is to start at hx equals zero, and then um, your um, um, old states are still eigenstates, um, because there's no time variation. Uh, now, when you would put on a finite HX, we can use uh, a perturbation theory or per perturbation logic. <laughs> you know, to actually work out perturbation theory is not, you know, uh, it's not as easy as conventional because this is uh, okay. Um, but what you, one finds is that there's a, a, a convergent time averaged Hamiltonian, Floquet Hamiltonian, and so that basically tells you that the same, which basically looks like the Ising uh, transverse field Ising model, and that more or less tells you that the uh, uh, the structure of the problem is the same as in the um, static case. And so here is a, uh, a time uh, uh, snapshot of the of one of the eigenstates. You have spatial order, and that spatial order uh, is repeated from one time step to another. Right. So there's, there are no modulations in time. Um, so the interesting thing, of course, is that uh, uh, be because there's this continuity to the static case, the same pairing of eigenvalues, the cat states, they uh, imply that the uh, quasi-energies of the problem are also nearly generative, um, that they come in pairs of two. Now, as I promised, that once you understand this case, the other case is almost a freebie, and that's because near the uh, 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 the other vertical phase boundary, um, we observe that the uh, uh, the Floquet evolution with so, so the, the unitary the, uh, the e to the minus i h x is a global um, uh, spin flip here. It's the p x up to a sign. And that means that the Floquet unitary is a product of Px and then uh, evolution with Hc. Okay. Again, so you, if we now go into the talk, because you've already seen the uh, rotating wave approximation or rotating wave transformation, we can always introduce a, a frame of reference which is obtained by transforming the basis with this Px. And so in that transform basis, then you see that the time evolution is trivial. Again, it's, it's HZ. And so the cartoon of the eigenmodes of the Floquet, of the full Floquet problem are the same one as before, right? Except you uh, uh, um, uh, as, as superpose a, uh, a pi, uh, um, sorry, a spin flip in the time domain. So what you see is that what used to be a, uh, a spin glass in a spatial direction now becomes a spin glass plus an oscillatory with a very well defined period pi in, in the time domain. That's why they called it pi spin glass. Okay. Um, the confusing thing, at least when you start thinking about this, uh, is how do you actually show that if you have imperfect flips uh, uh, about the x-axis, right? When you flip from up to down, what if you have an, an, uh, an incomplete pi flip, right? Because it seems like in a single particle problem, that will generate a super period, right? 
And the reason this doesn't happen here is for the same reason that uh, um, here, uh, a little bit of HX did not break this pattern. And that's because this is an interacting problem and the neighboring spins provide a very strong field along Z. And so with that very strong field along Z, you can do a floquet perturbation theory, just, just as we did here. And the mathematical structure is identical in a toggling frame. And so what you see is that these imperfect or incom you know, incomplete uh, uh, pi, fascia, uh, pi flips do not add up coherently. They just give you perturbative uh, suppression of the Z order. Now, the so there are two states, as usual. There are two, so that's at low orders in perturbation theory. In high orders in perturbation theory, you'll have to hybridize this state with a, with, with a, uh, with a uh, Z flip of this state. Um, and uh, because these things are time shifted by one time step, that's essentially like a, a um, uh, you know, the, there are two cat states, and the, uh, these cat states now have, uh, um, uh, um, how should I put it, a uh, floquet frequency which is folded, right? You don't have a band structure with from zero to pi, but rather you hybridize states at zero and pi, uh, states that are separated whose quasi energy is off by pi. And you observe this in the spectrum. So this is sort of the summary slide of what the um, spectrum of, the flo of, of these floquet problems is. Um, um, you can see that when you have a spin glass uh, phase, then um, there's sort of a spontaneous symmetry breaking uh, at zero in frequency give you um, this kind of a, a, a pairing of the nearby uh, eigenenergies, whereas the pi spin glass has degeneracies of, of eigenenergies that are diametrically opposed on the unit circle. Right? And the other states don't have any pair. Okay, so this is a summary slide of um, sort of just the spectrum. Um, but what about diagnostics? You know, as, as I said, I think the, 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 this kind of structure immediately suggests that there's going to be period doubling. And, uh, and you see period doubling in almost anything you want. So if you cross from here to here, you can uh, observe that, um, the, uh, you know, the, um, the, the period doubled component goes down. So you, you lose it. And again, I should emphasize that with, uh, without these interactions, none of this is an approximation. There's just approximate ways of seeing this without invoking, uh, uh, you know, uh, Jordan Bigner transformation, but all of this is kind of just there. I think that the di more difficult question is that what, right, so let me just uh, make a theoretical comment. The theoretical comment is that the more difficult question is what happens when these perturbations are finite? Um, I think there one can appeal to uh, many body, if, if the problem is many body localized, and this is something that we don't have a, a, a firm theoretical control over, but we have perturbative arguments, then one can demonstrate these time crystals are uh, um, robust um, uh, to all perturbations. They're stable, absolutely stable. So, um, right, so that's the first comment. Um, um, yeah, so since I, do, I don't have any references with dates, um, this activity is something that unfolded over the past uh, five years, four or five years. So it's pretty remarkable that the experiments uh, sprung, the experimentalists sprung to action. There's now uh, three platforms. Um, the current sort of a belief is that none of them are it. Um, they all show period doubling, uh, but they also all show how that period doubling attenuates. And there are theoretical reasons, there, there are firm theoretical reasons to believe that they should attenuate because the experiment doesn't satisfy these none of these experiments satisfy the um, uh, theoretical prerequisites um, uh, most of them don't satisfy it because they don't have many body localization because these are experiments that are usually in three dimensions with long-range interactions and things like that okay. so uh, I, I wanted to close with a, a, a so so that's mostly all I wanted to say that's uh, uh, concrete about time crystals um, I think it's just, uh, again, watching this unfold from uh, the sidelines, this was, this seemed nice, but 
a direct um, uh, you know uh, lift from what we already knew for the Hamiltonian system. So I, I, I was always debating how interesting this is. It's new, so that's nice. Uh, but I think the nice, so, so to me, the, the, the big payoff for actually making these slides and thinking about this and try to be pedagogical has been to think about the context, which sort of was very nicely discussed in this big review by uh, um, uh, Verika Himani, Shivaji Sondi, and Radek Mosner, where they looked at the history of these phenomena and also they try to put it in the context of bigger sort of physics issues. Um, so I think one of the things that's pretty clear is that time crystals are, so this is the second point that I wanted to, so first of all, here it's very clear that it's not just temporal order, it's, it's spatial temporal order, right? You need symmetry breaking the, to stabilize things. And that's partly kind of, you know, what we expect because in single particle problem, Periodic behaviors are a plenty. You know, we have pendulum, we have what have you. Uh, also in uh, uh, non-conservative systems, driven systems that, are, that eat up energy like clocks, but this is also pretty common. So we'd like to distance us, distance ourselves from that. Um, and um, so I think a breaking of symmetries and doing it on a macro scale is something that we need uh, in, in the many body case to stabilize something like a time crystal. Um, there were proposals um, from Wilczek and uh, I think from various other people um, to try to, to um, implement this notion of spatial temporal order and how that could sort of be realized. Um, it's not 100% clear to me that these proposals are 100% dead. There were no-go theorems by Watanabe and Oshikawa from a couple of years ago, in fact. Um, and it turns out that these theorems are correct for ground states. There are two theorems. One theorem is for the ground state. The other one is for uh, excited states. And it seems pretty clear that the theorem for the excited states has uh, some wiggle room in it. It's not clear that how to exploit the wiggle room. Um, but I think that, it, you know, one, one could, you know, so, so what I got out of reading uh, the literature a bit more um, is that there may be new directions here. It's just not clear what they are. I mean, I'll, I can discuss what, what I'm thinking about, but that's not, you know, that's not a, a, a guaranteed success thing. Um, and so basically the upshot is that uh, by now many, many versions of discrete time crystals have been constructed theoretically. Um, but the question here is that are there di genuinely different types of time crystals possible in theory? And I think this recent sort of round of cleaning up the thinking and thinking about properly defining these things so as not to incur the wrath of uh, people who like few body problems. Um, and I think that the, the thing that we're missing right now is that what are the new ingredients in the model? Okay, I think that's um, that's what I wanted to say about time crystals. So, if there are any questions, this is what we. Uh, uh, um, so, somebody's asking me about uh, projections uh, privately commenting. Matt, well, I shouldn't say. Um, <laughs> somebody privately soliciting projections. I think the projections that uh, at least something that I'm working on is how, um, and I'll comment this in the, in the in the context of the second portion of this lecture. Um, how the interplay between unitary evolution and measurement, external measurement, not necessarily a drive, but still interaction with the environment, can actually stabilize uh, um, uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking, which is not uh, um, of um, of this type. But it's 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 pretty premature now. I mean, I have a reference to give, which I'll include in the slides. But the 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 connection just directly with time crystals is missing at the moment. Okay, let's take a break until, oh, wait, no, there's another question. Um, okay, is there any way to keep my, ah, there we go, Alt-H. Was there another message? No, I don't see any messages. Okay, thank you. Oh, thank you, right, that's a message. All right, let's take a break until 12. Um, how do I unshare? Um, Presumably, you want to take a break oh, at 12.10 or something. 12.10, fine. Yes, I, since it's 12. <laughs>
break until 12 would be very short. Okay. Okay. Well, this is your next to last chance to ask questions about anything before. Um, I think the um, a fair summary of the time crystals portion of the lecture was to draw as much parallel as I, possible. I launched. I'm I listening to a lecture right now. There I am. Um, to draw as much parallel as possible between um, flow K and static problems and um, exploit it to demonstrate a period doubling phase of matter. Um, and I, yeah, I think the remaining question is already emphasized is where does one go from now, from here? Are there phenomena of this type that are different enough and what are the um, I mean, particularly, it would be nice to find phenomena that do not rely on many body localization because that's a very stringent requirement. But I don't have any good ideas for that. Well, except what I'm going to mention. Um, so let's see. So I would like to switch gears completely. And um, by completely, I mean there is no direct connection to flow K, there is no. Um, um, the, I guess the only connection is that um, uh, that there's you know the argument is that there's many body physics to be done with um, quantum computers, um, and that's not necessarily what the field is focused on. Um, I'm not going to belabor this point, but that, you know I think if you try to keep atten uh, pay attention to the field, you know we, we keep hearing about factorizing. Well, people are still talking about factorizing 15 and uh, improving the um, fidelity of individual qubits. That's interesting and important as well, but that's not what, what draws one to these problems, or at least draws me to these problems. So let me um, um, skip, well, in part, I, you know, I decided to skip um, uh, talking about what qubits and gates are and what quantum circuits are I'll flash some pictures at some point. Um, there's actually an interesting website uh, that I um, know of, uh, which sort of uh, organizes different quantum algorithms. You know, being an outsider to the field, one generally does not know much about the Shore algorithm and the Grover algorithm and a couple of others. But there's actually a whole zoo of algorithms. They're interrelated, so it's, it's bigger than it seems. It's smaller than it seems, I guess. Um, so instead, I'm going to jump straight to the uh, bullet three and four, which is uh, discuss what the Grover search is <clears throat> in a slide. It's a very simple idea um, and very influential. Mm. And then I will talk about this uh, uh, a recent set of results, which are interesting in a couple of different ways, which I will come to when I get to it. All right, so here is a Grover search in a nutshell. Um, if you haven't seen it before, um, it's a you know it was Grover is a computer scientist as far as I know, and so the field is strongly dominated by mathematicians and computer scientists who learned enough of quantum mechanics to exploit it, and so it's formulated as such. So mm, consider searching for a specific pattern of n bits, you know, some combination of plus and minus ones, or zeros and ones. Um, and the database in which you're searching for, well, let's say that you're guaranteed it's somewhere in that database. And the database is a complete database, at least the way I'm going to discuss it, it's a complete database of all possible patterns. It has no structure whatsoever. I think it's pretty obvious to anybody to a microsecond that this is a hopelessly difficult task. You basically have to um, systematically try and you might get lucky, you might not, but typically you will not get lucky. The number of patterns is 2 to the n, and that's how many tries roughly you're going to have, or 2 to the n over 2, or whatever. Mm, now, if, um, if you had access to a quantum computer, you could try to encode this pattern in a particular state file. Now, let's me, let me pick a computational basis to be the z basis. But now, because we uh, have a quantum computer, we can consider a state which is a very different state 
mm, which is an X state. In fact, you can prepare a state, which is if you start with a computational basis all once, you can prepare a state with every pointing x by applying order well applying n operations <clears throat> to the um to basically each qubit rotated by pi over two will give you that okay now this state is a peculiar state it's a superposition of the entire space of configuration so this is the database okay now the most important thing for the remainder of 10 uh, the remainder of, of the slides, probably for the next 10 slides or so, is this overlap between this <clears throat> state that you care for, about, uh, the uh, phi, the state you're searching for, and the database, which is, or the paramagnetic, you know, I'll call it the paramagnet because, you know, um, this is the ground state of a transverse field. Um, um, and this overlap scales as, whoops, uh, so, okay, here's an example of this uh, uh, continuous sort of a typo that um, the overlap does not scale as n, n to the minus one half, it scales as two to the minus n, over. it's a square root of the size of the Hilbert space. I should think, I should fix it right now, I'm sorry. Um, how would I fix it so that it doesn't keep coming back? I apologize, it's so annoying. Um, Minus n over two. Ugh. Oh, give me a break. Okay, I apologize. Just give me one second. Okay. All right, let's go back to full screen now. Okay. So um, what Grover pointed out was that you can consider a unitary constructed by the, uh, through these projectors. Now, th these two states are nearly orthogonal. That's just a statement that it's very difficult to find the state in a database. Um, and so when you construct a unitary out of these projectors and ones stand here for identities, what you find is that this unitary is basically an identity. And, um, but it has a component along the, uh, the, the proper rotation from uh, S to phi. So if you apply this unitary a large number of times, you can rotate the totally unstructured database into the state that you're looking for and the number of states is roughly two to the n over two it's an it's it's a probabilistic statement that with probability one you will be very close to the state that you desire okay so this is it i mean I, you know there are various generalizations and whatever but this is sort of a a very simple demonstration um of how essentially the the fact that in quantum mechanics the um, amplitude, right? So, so you, you'll see this come up again, that if you think about time scales, which you might say that you know, if you have a gap, you get a time scale. Um, time scales or gaps are often linear in the amplitude rather than quadratic. And that allows you a speed up. This factor of two is a speed up compared to the classical result, okay? All right, without further ado, this is sort of a, 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 you know, setting the stage. You know, before I, you know, even though I haven't, you know, nobody ever talks about it, but of course the Grover algorithm is an example of a Floquet problem, <laughs> right? You've got the unitary and you keep hitting the system with it. Um, but it's not a Floquet problem that particularly cares about the, um, uh, uh, the infinite time uh, state, but it's actually a transient. But still, the, the spectrum of this Floquet problem is pretty clear if you think about it in the sense that it only mixes the two states, it doesn't touch the rest, two to the n um, uh, minus two states. So it's, it's a peculiar Floquet problem, but nevertheless. All right, so um, there are different flavors of quantum computing. Um, the flavor that um, uh, was originally envisaged uh, is a gate-based quantum computer in part because it was 
somehow designed by people who are thinking about classical computers. And there you've got registers, bits, and you've got um, operations. Um, and sometime, I forget, in the 1990s, probably, I should have put the dates here, um, a different viewpoint sort of was advocated. And initially, there was quite a bit of excitement because it seemed different enough. Um, but I think the more people have thought about it, they realize that the problems are kind of inherited. The difficulties are inherited. Um, and this goes, so there's a basic phenomenon of quantum annealing. And uh, I realize that I'm not uh, showing my slides bit by bit. So most of you have already read the slide, um, but let me re now read it myself. Um, so quantum, uh, qu you know, what is annealing? Annealing is basically changing the conditions of equilibrium, usually slowly, so that the system adjusts gently rather than just falling off a building. You can climb down a building if you like. That's anthropomorphic view of annealing. Um, in particular, this uh, idea that by changing uh, the equilibrium state slowly might gain you some um, uh, power is something that was put in, into practice computationally, which is called simulated annealing, where you essentially simulate the people, uh, the, the, uh, a difficult problem. The original application was to the traveling salesman problem um, uh, using a, a technique which usually doesn't get you all the way to the uh, uh, ground state, but if you change the temperature slowly and you go back and forth, you can actually get a better solution. Okay. Um, and the, the standard reference to the quantum version of this is to Nishimori, um, although I imagine this has been discussed before. The idea is that suppose that there is a problem for whose ground state that you, you would like to know, which I label here as a target, H target, and there is a problem that has a trivial ground state that you can prepare. And the idea is that by gently changing the, um, the um, time from zero to capital T, um, the ground state changes. You know, so if you think of doing this in, in a real experiment, you would have to do this extremely slowly. Right? And how slowly is basically the crux of the problem. But if you do it slowly enough, the quantum adiabatic theorem guarantees that you will get the ground state of H target at the end of this evolution. Okay. Um, now, the reason why this was uh, exciting, and I think shortly thereafter, within a year, uh, uh, I don't know how much interaction between these groups there was, uh, Eddie Farhi, uh, Farhi, Goldstone, I think a couple of other collaborators, uh, proposed that one can simply encode computational any any computation almost any computational problem one has can be encoded into finding ground state of some generalized classical Ising model, and so adiabatic quantum computing um, was born. Right? Basically, the idea is that you start with a simple H naught, but you initialize in a simple H naught, and you uh, uh, sweep the field or sweep the um, the Hamiltonian from H naught to H target. I should also comment that there is a um, version of this, which is the quantum kibble zurich type physics, where you uh, um, go through a phase transition at a finite rate. And one generally finds that uh, you fall out of equilibrium at some point. The system stops being adiabatic. And so the, the relationships uh, between these problems, but the quantum computing problems is sufficiently different um, that um, I, you know, I don't know of uh, particular benefits of thinking in both ways. And how are they different? So, uh, you know, adiabatic com quantum computing is not a free lunch, right? because what usually happens is that the, well, what you expect a priori is the time to solution is um, uh, uh, scales as inverse gap. That's what you need to satisfy to obey the adiabatic theorem. Um, and um, what you know is that what, what often happens is that the target Hamiltonian is sufficiently complex that the state to which you're going to is separated from the paramagnetic initial state by phase transition. And if that's the case, then the uh, one generically expects uh, uh, that, there is, that there is going to be critical slowing down. And I think the initial um, excitement here was to uh, um, 
try to look for ways to, of making this phase transition to be a continuous phase transition, because there we expect that the gap scaling the system size is power long. Because then that means that the critical slowing down is at worst polynomial with system size. And that's better than, well, that's better than exponential. Polynomials are good. Um, so the current state of the art is that almost, or in fact, all of the interesting problems do not have a critical point, And we don't know how to um, find critical points in these problems. All, all of them are exponential. Um, and that's probably a good thing because some of these problems are uh, known not to be solvable. Uh, they're, they're complex. Um, and, and so there, there's no free lunch. But what's interesting is, um, um, sorry, I don't see my own screen here. Um, right, so, so there's one interesting comment to make is that in most of these, in some cases that, are, that have been studied in, in detail, uh, whoops, in, in some cases that have been studied in detail, so-called stochastic problems, it's in fact known uh, um, that the uh, delta min scales in the same way as uh, it would scale in, the cl in classical simulated annealing. So not only that these problems are exponentially slow, but the time to solution is no better than just doing classical Monte Carlo. Okay, and this is a real bummer, right? Because it's one thing to say that, well, it's a difficult problem, but uh, by paying uh, uh, for a quantum computer, we can at least so, you know change the difficulty exponent. So it scales, uh, uh, the time to solution is exponentially um, shorter than the classical algorithm. But if one um, doesn't even believe that, then the whole game is um, suspect. Okay. Um, so let's, since uh, we already looked at Grover, so let's look at how the adiabatic Grover would work. And um, this is not so, so the famous paper in this uh, uh, problem is this by Roland and Cerf, um, where who sort of shortly after the adiabatic sort of protocol was uh, proposed, they sort of showed how this works out in detail for the Grover problem. <clears throat> what I'm doing here is not what they've done because they, they did not have the paramagnetic term in the Hamiltonian, they basically um, solved the Floquet problem or the. You know, problem with the same spectrum as the Floquet problem that I already alluded to. Whereas here we're going to do it the way Farhan company sort of imagined that, that there is a paramagnetic term that makes the problem easy. And the spectrum of this problem, the instantaneous spectrum of this problem, it looks like this. The G is the Grover state, is the state that I previously referred to as phi. And what you see is that as you crank up S, at some critical S, which here is probably one or n, okay, there's, there's simple numbers here. Um, this Grover state, basically, it basically descends and at some point it becomes the ground state. Because the state is nearly orthogonal to the rest of the spectrum, it has no difficulties crossing exponentially, you know, there are exponentially avoided crossings with lots of states, in particular the paramagnetic ground state. So the, um, if you were trying to sweep this problem slowly, you would, you would want to follow the ground state and therefore you would have to um, slow down. And so the, the, um, the point um, that, that became appreciated uh, uh, from the time of uh, Roland and Cerf is that not only that you have to go slowly, um, but you really have to slow down uh, at the right place. Um, in other words, there's in order to achieve this optimal slowdown, 2 to the minus L over 2, um, you cannot just sweep at a constant rate uh, 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 everywhere. And so what, what, you know, the punchline here is that not only that it's, it's exponentially, uh, uh, um, still exponentially difficult, but it's also exponentially sensitive to this knowledge of where the crossing takes place. And at constant sweep rate, you get back uh, uh, the the diabatic formula, which again is lacking the speed up, right? It will give you uh, that factor of two, which you gained from Grover is gone. So this exponential sensitivity of the algorithm to location of the transition 
is is a you know I think it's a serious physical limitation. It's not um, you know I don't fully understand why it's not as emphasized. And maybe I'm just uh, uh, you know not aware of other people who worry about this. Uh, I only became sort of worried about it this in the last two three years. Um, but you know so so here's the question. So now the question is that how do you make this algorithm less exponentially less sensitive to this uh, resource of knowledge uh, of knowing where the transition is. And, and this is sort of goes by the way of how do you generally speed things up. Um, so here's an intuitive picture. Um, sorry, um, there's a weird tab that's blocking my screen. I don't know how to hide it. Nope. Nope, not hiding. Okay. So the intuitive picture is, um, you know, in the slow passage, we will go from a ground state to a ground state. In the fast passage, is my screen visible, by the way? Or like the bottom of the screen, is, is it visible? I just want to make sure, because I can't see it. Ah, sure. Yeah, okay, good. Um, right, so, but if you go with a fast passage, the blue you know, I use blue to indicate the, the, where you end up. So you, you don't notice the avoided crossing. In fact, you avoid it. And the idea is that the only way for, the, uh, for this uh, passage to successfully give you the ground state on the other side is that you have to do something to your wave function before you reach the passing or, or after. So if, you're, if you haven't crossed the, uh, the, the crossing, you should uh, pre-kick the state if you are on the other side, you should kick it downwards, right? So the idea is that you want to convert by, by having this transition, you want to essentially convert what used to be a problem into a solution. And the basic idea is that um, this, you know, if you set, uh, create a setup where these kinds of transitions are everywhere, then it really is not that important to know where this, where the, where the true trend, the ground state, the ground state transition is. Right? You, you, you can basically blur out this, be, the, this region into sort of a, a, um, a region where you make lots and lots of these transitions. And that's basically what we're after here. And, um, you know, there, there's a, um, another sort of a subfield that recently grew called shortcuts to adiabaticity. Uh, and those of you who are familiar with those works might um, recognize something similar here. Um, I haven't tried to make uh, formal connections, but you know, I, you know, I'm much more comfortable with these sort of a pathways, coherence pathways in the Schrodinger equation. <laughs> okay, so so let me just define the problem because it's you know past a certain point, it's easier to just to do things rather than talk about them. So the, you know, again, this is something that you've seen already a couple of times. Um, this is the rotating wave uh, uh, time dependence of a transverse field, right? So the transver the original problem had static transverse fields. Now we're going to introduce time dependence, in fact, oscillatory time, not, not constant rate, but oscillatory time dependence in the orientations of transverse fields, okay? So when alpha is when alpha is equal to zero, we're back to the uh, previous formula, right? Just every qubit has a transverse field. When alpha is finite, uh, these transverse fields are jiggling or wiggling. Right? Um, we're going to keep the magnitude of this perturbation the same, um, although I think they're interesting generalizations when they're not the same. Um, but the frequencies are going to be all over the place. In, 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 a, in a certain band, but the frequencies and the phases are random, and that's very important. In fact, as you'll see before uh, uh, soon, it's very important to keep these frequencies low. Right? We're interested in this crossing being nearly avoided, maybe not exponentially close, because we, you know, the, the whole idea is to move this algorithm away from exponential sensitivity. So we would like these two states to be nearby. Uh, so parallel nearby is good enough, and so the idea is that the frequencies which we will be using to do this pre-kicking will be small, parametrically small. And the reason this is very important is because unlike the, all of the previous sort of a driven problems, you know, Floquet and whatnot, where um, 
we were interested in the entire spectrum and things were kind of generic in the spectrum. Here, we're really interested in keeping the system in the low energy manifold and to be specific within the two ground state, the, the, within the two putative ground states, right? These things were ground states. And so we want to keep it there. And so the basic question now is that, well, where is the speed up going to come from? And um, so the cartoon that I had previously showed the um, uh, first order process or the direct process where you just have a frequency and you just you know, feed it in. And at some point when these two states are close, just the right resonance frequency, you just make the, your diabetic transition. Um, but because this is a many body system, you can imagine that all of these excited states, which give you virtual transitions, they can be integrated out or traced over, and they will generate an exponentially many t a number of terms, in this case being sums and differences of various frequency combinations, that will essentially create for you a whole uh, 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 shower of these transitions at various uh, uh, distances from the true crossing. And so this is sort of the basic sort of a mechanism for how you can take, by, by, by introducing, right, so it's, it's very important. This is not a Floquet problem, because in the Floquet problem, you just have a one free, or a single frequency in which you're driving the system. Um, here, you're, I'm going to introduce, I'm introducing uh, uh, each qubit gets its own frequency. So this is not a Floquet problem, but we're not thinking about non-perturbative physics. We're, we're trying to do perturbation theory uh, order by order in perturbation theory, and we're only keeping perturbative corrections to to the evolution of the uh, within the uh, double ground state double. Okay. Um, all right. So I think I said everything, and so the basic idea is not to do anything non-perturbative. I'll say it again. We're going to be keeping track of diabetic transitions initiated by uh, uh, various high order processes. Okay. So this. This seems like a difficult problem, and it's a bit involved, but there is a funny magic in the Grover problem, as you might guess. Right, so first of all, I mean, it's pretty clear why the Grover problem is a good problem to do this with, other than that you can do calculations. The Grover problem is the problem where um, uh, um, it's easy to see that there is no shortcut classically. So the classical difficulty of this problem is non-negotiable. There's no structure. And these kinds of problems exist and they're very useful for demonstrating quantum speedups because you're competing against a beast of a, pro of a classical problem, right? So it's just, um, you know, any progress you make there is a quantum speedup, roughly speaking. Um, you know, otherwise you get into arguments with, uh, you know, people who do classical optimization because they would say that, well, if we try hard enough, we'll find a more optimal way to solve the problem. Um, so in any case, so just to continue um, here, so the Grover problem has an interesting simplification. And I, and I warn you that there is a, um, there's an issue here with switching L's and N's. And whenever I see that this is happening, I'll comment on it. So I like to use L as the system size, the number of qubits and N as the Hilbert space size, but that's not um, so in particular, you know, in our paper, we used N for the number of qubits and at some point I kind of ran out of time retyping equations. So there's an interesting reduction in the Grover problem. Instead of the full Hilbert space being connected to exponential precision, you can reduce the uh, Hilbert space that connects to the ground state uh, to just L plus one. And you could all, already almost see this here uh, when, you, when I drew this diagram. Basically, anytime the Grover state is degenerate with the uh, paramagnet, so these are bands of paramagnetic excitations characterized by the number of flips. It turns out that there's a unique state to which it connects. And these are these unique states, right? So if you, uh, if the, the, if you represent the Grover state, and here's a pattern of the Grover sort of polarization in the computational basis, you can create um, these uh, uh, special members of the paramagnetic hierarchy by exciting the ground state with this pattern. And what you find is that in this reduced Hilbert space, you can solve the uh, um, uh, problem 
uh, for the perturbed ground states. And you can see that there's this pattern of admixtures where the ground state gets admixed with the Grover state by the famous amplitude. The first excited state gets admixed and so on and so forth, okay? Most importantly, the Grover state itself is mixed up with the entire paramagnetic hierarchy. You know, and the and there are denominators and things like that. So this is this is potentially boring perturbation theory, but this, it's extremely useful here. And because of this Hilbert space reduction, you can go uh, to town and start computing matrix elements. Um, and the most important thing. So the, the, these are the you know. So so you can read off the matrix element uh, um, uh, between the Grover state and ground state from this or perturbative structure, uh, the most important thing is that we're not interested in any uh, place in the phase diagram. We're interested when this frequency, which we're driving it with, is on resonance, right? And so you make a transition and that means, so by the way, right, the single particle gap is scaled as one over the, uh, one over L or one over N. And so it shows up in both places, right? So kappa is the single particle gap. So this denominator is making a sing it comes from a virtual state with one spin flip. And so the, the single particle gap cancels, um, you're on resonance. And so this is sort of a, 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 the, the leading sort of term, um, but we can keep going. And um, okay. there's a pattern that emerges. And I think we went up, I, I went up to third order. My collaborator might've gone up fourth order, just to check the pattern. Um, here's a pattern. Most importantly, these matrix elements are um, all scaling as two to the minus n over two or two to the minus l over two, which here I labeled as omega naught. Okay. And so what you see is that they're, they're all progressively small. This is perturbation theory after all. This is, there's no magic here. Um, and so what you see is that uh, because these matrix elements all scale with a system size in the same way. Ever could ever. Question, sorry. Was that a question or? Sorry, I didn't. Sorry, well, okay, interrupt. Please feel free to interrupt me. Um, the, the basic idea is that, look, um, what happens to all orders in perturbation theory? Can you resum this um, because of this sort of a nice um, uh, simple M dependence? And the answer is yes. So here's the answer. There's some binomial coefficients you get from combinatorics. Um, and here's the answer, right? So basically the, the, what this formula is, is allowing for all of these transitions, right? And then um, asking what is the, and right, because the diabetic, and we assume that these diabetic transitions, you know, there's nothing, there's, there, there's no interference here because we're doing sort of uh, leading order type analysis. Um, there, to be sure, there are interference terms in this perturbation theory, but if the physics that we're after is just weak diabetic transitions, you know, we can, uh, uh, at least to start with, we can ignore these interference terms. And I think understanding the full perturbative structure here is an open question. <laughs> you know, this was difficult enough, so that getting an answer was interesting. Okay, this is a very common situation in physics. And what you see is that uh, the cool thing is that this is a, um, this is sort of a standard thing is that you get an exponentially suppressed uh, 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 sequence of contributions, but the entropy of these contributions blows up. And so what you get is that this resums to an exponent of its own. And because this is a diabetic contribution, it scales as delta squared. So there's one over two n. This is by itself, this is terrible. But because there's a positive exponential here, we get that the difficulty exponent, which uh, I think can be defined, although I don't know how common this notation is, is basically the log base two of the uh, scaling of this uh, transfer rate is reduced, okay? And alpha is basically the, the, the strength of this wiggle. It's not the strength of the transverse field. Transverse field is near, you know, near the transition somewhere, okay? All right, so this is the basic result. Now I'm going to uh, uh, discuss it, like its implications. So if there's any questions, this is a good place to stop. All right, so, so I think the important thing is that despite its many body nature, this problem is re reducible to elementary quantum mechanics. 
that was sort of a well except for this perturbative structure but you know if you believe in induction proof by induction <laughs> it is probably okay too okay so if there are no questions I'll, let me just try to um, uh, finish up okay um, so in principle one can just go to town and try to test this functional form with the new kinds of numerics we can set up, but because this is work, and because you know ultimately the readership of this work may not be sort of only physicists, but rather experimentalists who will say, well, how far can you go? Um, one can uh, pretend to be uh, uh, well. One well, can basically ask, you know, one can ask, where does this perturbation theory break down? Or one can say that, well. Even when alpha is equal to one, this is a perturbation. Maybe this is a perturbation theory in alpha squared over eight, right? And then alpha squared over eight is still pretty small. <laughs> so maybe we can be in the perturbative regime even when this perturbation is strong, right? And so then one can take a you know if 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 we take a closer look at the form of the perturbation we, uh, of the driver, we realize that it's peculiar, right? When you crank up alpha under the cosine, you don't necessarily get a stronger drive because of the uh, Fourier decomposition of a cosine of an oscillatory term is a Bessel series. And so what you find is that if I'm primarily interested in the uh, uh, um, first harmonic or first few harmonics, actually first harmonic basically gets you this result to two decimal places, there is an optimal strength of the drive alpha, which is stated here, and at that value of alpha, just going back to the perturbative formula and evaluating it, you get an answer. Right? And this answer is not um, bad in the sense that it uh, gets you halfway to the uh, uh, optimal value for grower, which is n over 2. Um, all right, it gets you to 0.75 or roughly so. And you might ask uh, one, one question, uh, one comment I'll make is that this is a very peculiar form of a drive. And initially, somehow you might say that, well, why don't you jiggle the field itself? And you realize that the funny thing about this drive is that if you have multiple frequencies, you kind of want to look at one frequency at a time. And if you look at one frequency at a time for this analysis, in other words, you, you imagine that somehow things are adiabatic. Well, it, it's, you know, you're, adi you're diabetic with respect to one frequency, a combination of frequencies, and you're adiabatic with respect to rest. And so if you treat the others as stationary, you don't change the spectrum of the problem. And we saw this in uh, trying to compare with numerics, you know, different analyses that implementing this particular drive in the, uh, in the numerics gave the cleanest comparison to the theoretical prediction, which you'll see next. Um, but also this is realizable in the experiment. So this is sort of a peculiar example where the microscopic detail of how you realize it really matters. All right, so here's a numerical test and uh, I admit it's much better than one could imagine. I mean, it's just, just really spectacular. The way this is set up, um, and I'm not, I'm not being facetious, I mean, this is really amazing. Um, so the way this is being set up is that this is sort of a, one of these bang and wait protocols where we, instead of sweeping, honestly, and I, I thought I had a slide on that, but okay, never mind. Um, instead of sweeping the problem, we basically uh, move rapidly to the vicinity of the transition, uh, but we purposely detune, we, we introduce some random, randomness so, you know, our computer does know where the transition is exactly. Right, so we're within a power law of the transition. And then we um, uh, just run under this Hamiltonian with the Grover term. And we ask if the runtime is uh, 2 to the n over 2, what is the probability of success? And we know that if we fine tune the problem to the transition, the, run to, uh, the probability of success would be 1. If we don't fine tune to the transition and there are no uh, um, um, uh, drives, there's no nothing else. The probability of success is 2 to the minus n over 2, right? You basically, you wait 2 to the n over 2, so you wait a long time, but you get a diminishing sort of a with n probability. That's basically the classical, classical scaling. 
and that's the blue trace and the uh, uh, orange trace is the probability of the success with these RF perturbations and the straight line is basically the theoretical prediction. Okay. Or close to theoretical, I forget, it might be a fit, but uh, it's, it's a really good quantitative agreement with uh, just blind, blind, I shouldn't say blind, but it's an application of perturbation theory. Okay. So I think this is sort of uh, uh, the proof in the pudding type uh, uh, demonstration that um, this analysis works. Now, there are effects that are not captured in this analysis. Um, and one of them is heating. Right? There's always a, a, this sort of a axe of heating that uh, hovers over all of these driven problems. Um, now, here we're in a good shape. At least we believe in, in it's, it's not a theorem yet. But one knows that um, heating is uh, adiabatically suppressed if there is a gap, right? In this case, we're, we've purposely reduced our frequencies uh, uh, um, uh, parametrically with a system size so that the con conventional sort of adiabatic estimates of heating give us a heating rate which itself is, you know, exponentially small in system size. So. So as long as delta squared over F um, is, um, remember alpha is not scaling with system size, but delta squared and F can be scaled with system size. And the idea is that if we suppress the, the, the thing in the exponent uh, parametrically in system size, we get uh, 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 no heating essentially. So these numerics do not seem to have any signs of heating despite waiting for exponentially long. It's an important point here is that, uh, which I already made, that all of these perturbative results for transitions um, don't care how where the frequency is as long as you're in resonance. So this seems like free lunch, and as usual, when something seems like a free lunch, uh, it isn't. So it turns out that one shouldn't reduce the frequency arbitrarily. So, so numerically, it's difficult to see results when you reduce the frequency arbitrarily because you need to add a time average well enough. But also, there are other reasons for why this might, uh, you know. Be problematic, but at least you know within reason you can uh, change the power law on the frequency distribution. Okay, so I think that's basically um, it for this problem. Um, um, so we, we've applied it to different other featureless oracle problems that works. Um, there are many details in discussion in this recent. Uh, so the date here is not quite right, but uh, the link is correct. Um, um, there. Um, so the interesting thing is that the, what this basically tells you is that you can boost matrix elements between uh, uh, for collective spin tunneling. And uh, there are other places where this shows up. This shows up in uh, cooling, like basically if you couple the system to a cold bath. So we've applied these kinds of uh, uh, perturbation theories to, to those processes as well. Um, I think the big motiv motivator for, for this was to uh, make a quantum annealer robust against uh, uh, noise. And I think that's, that's a really uh, big open problem. We have reasons to believe that now that it's made robust against this exponential sensitivity to knowing where the transition is, it's much more resi noise resilient, possibly asymptotically. And so the arguments are uh, uh, spelled out in this paper. It's far less clear and clean than the perturbative derivation that I just showed you for this sort of uh, acceleration. Um, and some of the things that we're working on is coming back to sort of uh, con condensed matter proper and thinking about physical problems with real sp spatial structure and how that works. Okay, so I think um, I have some loose things to say about error correction, and um, but otherwise I'm done. So if there are any questions about this adiabatic annealer exposed to uh, a radio frequency, sort of uh, uh, multiple frequencies, um, uh, I'll, uh, I should take them now. Okay, so since um, there was a question about where to go with time crystals and whatnot, um, I thought that I would set up another very current uh, sort of a, a development uh, right now to uh, re-examine error correction, which I schematically uh, represented here as a circuit, so, 
um, as a um, uh, as a quantum circuit on which, you know, in fact, you know, not quite floquet, it's a, it's a random quantum circuit. And so one of the sort of uh, drivers here is that um, the threshold theorem that guarantees that there exist error correction protocols, at least for the gate-based uh, quantum compu computers with uncorrelated errors, they translate to a uh, f genuine phase transition in the thermodynamic limit between a phase that is thermalizing and a phase that's not thermalizing. So this is an example, if you like, this is the many body version of the Zeno paradox, where if you keep measuring qubits, um, you uh, uh, arrest the growth of quantum entanglement. And, you know, and that, you know, in, at least from the point of view of quantum information theory or ergodic thermalization, uh, ergodic, uh, uh, I can say thermalization hypothesis, this would not be uh, um, sort of a thermalizing system. And so the interesting thing uh, that uh, uh, one of the um, potential possibilities is that if instead of having um, random errors, if you organize the errors that this is a uh, time periodic system uh, or measurements and you post select measurements. So to re basically the idea is to remove the randomness from this quantum circuit. Um, um, one can see this at least for a few qubits that there are modulated phases that are similar looking to time crystals that show up. And uh, I'll be happy if anybody has questions, I'll be, I'll, I'll put a reference here with this sort of a um, probably unjustified conjecture that somehow, uh, you know, working with this sort of a, a type of setups where you have classical steps, measurement and possibly post selection that you can actually um, uh, uh, find a route back to the uh, uh, phases with time modulations that are, that are very distinct from uh, discrete time crystals that we discussed. Okay. All right, so I think this is basically it. Um, um, I think the goal of, you know, my, my selfish goal uh, for choosing to talk about driven problems was to um, Spend well, essentially, make sure that I'm up to date on the literature and I read things that I skipped as some of these things developed. I think these are interesting problems, and I think there are possibly new directions to explore. Um, you know, you, you, you've already gotten this sort of a punchline from me that I think uh, uh, figuring out how to be away from equilibrium, even without the drive, is possibly the most useful thing. Um, now, this could be fully out of equilibrium, like, like MBL, or it could be equilibrium as a transient, uh, non-equilibrium as a transient state. And then the idea is that if you now start driving it fast enough, you might stabilize the disequilibrated state. And, um, you know, it always helps to have concrete examples. So I think that's why I chose time crystals as something that was very, um, um, that captured headlines, so it's good to know what the headlines are about. Uh, but the discrete time crystals, at least for now, they don't seem like they naturally lead to um, uh, future studies. One has to have new ideas. All right, I think I'm done. Um, if nobody has any questions, then we're done. Okay, Vadim, thank you. Um, thanks to everybody who, uh, who stayed with us and, and, and stayed involved. Um, again, if maybe there are a couple of questions or if not, um, let's stop here and, ah, there's one more, but that I guess is from you. So. Oh no, yes, just thanks. Very good. So let me remind you that um, we will have our, our general discussion about life and science next week on Friday. Um, and you're invited to send uh, questions in advance, but of course also uh, to ask in person. We'll just use the questions from, that are emailed in um, as a way of organizing the discussion. Um, so thank you all and thanks again to Vadim. Ah, so that's an example of, we're starting to see those general questions. So hold on to those for, uh, I think, I think the question of how we choose problems is something that, that maybe each of the panelists will take a crack at.
Um, well, perhaps. if you're a graduate student, then you don't have a choice. <laughs> yeah. Oh. I, I, I misread the question is who made you choose? <laughs> who made you choose? Yes. Now, what made you choose these particular problems? So, um, yes, one of the things we will certainly talk about next week is, is problem choice. And um, I think everybody will have a, everybody will have a take and that, that should be, maybe that maybe we'll start there and move from there to uh, uh, more personal, more personal questions. Yeah. All right. So thanks, every thanks everyone, um, and we'll see you next week. Thanks, Vadim. All right. Take care. Thanks.